back by popular demand, we have Mike Shikashio now. He spoke at the DBC last year. Uh, everybody loved him. He has the most wonderful podcast. I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge follower. So many of my uh, students at VSA go on to take his really, really amazing aggression course. Uh, Mike Shikashio is back to talk uh, to us about what he's going to talk about in the Dog Behavior Conference. And so for you guys, if you haven't registered yet, Dog Behavior Conference, April the 1st to the 3rd, it is virtual, it's online. And if you register, you have access to all the presentations for 12 months afterwards. So don't have to be there live all the time, but do come and join us uh, so that you can hear Mike and other wonderful presenters talk about a variety of topics. But first of all, Mike, welcome. Thank you, Victoria. It's so good to be back. I'm, I'm really excited for this conference. It's such a great lineup you have this year. Yeah, I mean, you know, every year I go, oh, this is, this is the best lineup ever. And now this year, this is the best lineup ever. Um, you're going to be talking about uh, what the title of your talk is, Don't Bite the Hand That Feeds You, Success in Challenging Resource Guarding Cases. Can you tell um, uh, people listening here, how, how common is resource guarding? I think that's a great question because it's actually a very normal behavior for mm -hmm. dogs and for people uh, to guard things of value to them. And so it is very common. It just becomes a problem when the dog, of course, starts biting. And usually that's a function of what we're doing as a person or the people involved that are kind of pushing the dog to bite, maybe by trying the wrong things or something read, they read online. But it is very, very common. It's, it's one of the most common types of behavior cases I'll see. Now you are going to be talking about how to how to sort of how to deal with it, how to work with it. But um, what I like about uh, about your talk is that not only are you going to give tips on how to deal with resource guarding, but you're also going to delve deeper into well, you try it all, and what happens if that doesn't work? Right. And so I hope it covers a little bit of everything for everybody watching, because I know that there's going to be some seasoned trainers that have worked a lot of resource garden cases and maybe some pet owners that are going through some of these issues with their own dogs. So it's going to be a little bit of everything. I'm going to cover some of the basic strategies we use in resource garden cases that a lot of the trainers I'm sure are very familiar with. And then I'm going to get into more advanced topics where we have to troubleshoot and problem solve some more difficult cases, such as, you know, generalized guarding is one where a dog just starts to guard everything, <laughs> almost like they're guarding the air that they're breathing. And those can be very difficult cases because the, the person's living with a dog that's generalized guarding. So they're really on edge all the time. And so I'll be covering some of those aspects as well. So hope to uh, give a little bit of information for everybody that's joining. Why do dogs guard things? They're going to protect things of value. I mean, it's it's how species, you know, animals all around the planet have survived for thousands of years because we protect something of value to survive. And so that's why dogs do that. They it's just, you know, what we've they they've learned how to do many, many eons and same thing with people we're going to protect things that are going to help us survive and we've seen it quite often in just the last couple of years if you think about how toilet paper and hand sanitizer were were being heavily guarded <laughs> just a couple of years ago and now maybe it's the covid test the rapid at home test kits i remember so trying to find those a, a couple of months ago and uh and those are things of value and so if somebody tries to take it from us we're going to do what's natural. It's just, this is, I need this to survive or I need it at the moment, or at least I perceive I need it at the moment and I'm going to try to protect it. And so that's what dogs are doing with their resources. And it's going to vary depending on the dog. You know, it's some dogs will really voraciously guard their food and others will be like, Oh, okay, less, you can have that kibble. I'll go on to something else. Or, you know, they might guard something that isn't as common. You know, they might've stolen a sock and they might guard that voraciously, whereas another dog's like socks. What, you know, what's the point? <laughs> so, it's uh, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, I think, to to uh, dive deep into those topics as far as what dogs guard and why dogs guard what they do. How did you get into this? A this business, but then how did you put your focus on aggression cases? 
You know, it's, it's, it started when I started fostering and doing a lot of rescue work. So I was volunteering for different rescues and I loved uh, bringing in foster dogs, you know, and helping the dogs there. And I wasn't even a trainer back then. I was just kind of, um, you know, I was working at a totally different career and I jumped into this foster and rescue stuff. And then you end up getting dogs as, as many foster parents out there know, they start sending you more difficult dogs because they know you're good at managing those type of dogs. And I started getting some minor aggression issues, you know, resource guarding or, you know, dogs that bark and lunge on leash, those typical things. And so that's what sparked my interest in behavior, because I realized that one of the number one reasons for owner surrender or behavioral youth or euthanasia is behavior. And what better way to help the dogs than to help them with the behavior issues. So I started to get getting more and more into aggression. And that's one of the most common uh, issues I was seeing with the dogs I was fostering as far as the surrender to the rescue or why they were given up or maybe they weren't adoptable because of the aggression issues. And so that's where I caught the behavior bug and I took a deep dive into all of the different ways of learning about behavior and training and, uh, and it sort of blossomed into what I'm doing now is just working with aggression cases exclusively. Now, um, there is, uh, I guess, there are a lot of different ways that trainers work with aggressive behavior. Um, are there any guarantees? Because uh, I think the issue is that, uh, or the, the myths that I've heard out there, or maybe the statements I should say, that I think are myths are, um, oh, every dog can be trained. And, um, Obviously, you know, the one that we have talked about before, the red zone dogs need to have a heavier hand. Um, do you encounter that a lot? Is that is the sort of do people when you're working with the cases, do they expect you to come in and wave your magic wand? Are they still sort of stuck with what maybe other popular media says or are you seeing a change? I've I think that the pet owning population is is becoming more savvy in understanding how behavior works because it really isn't a light switch as you know we can't just turn off aggressive behavior and say you're never going to display aggressive behavior again uh based on my magical training it never there's no guarantees with behavior and it's just like people so what i do to help my clients understand that is use a lot of human analogies so if a human is somebody breaks into your home Right. And I can I can make it less likely for you to get violent with the person coming into the home. I could teach you some alternative behaviors, perhaps some alternative strategies to dealing with that. But it doesn't mean you're you're never going to defend your home again. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I can make it you might defend it in a certain way. You might be a little more democratic and try to talk to that person, but mm -hmm. you never get rid of the actual, you know, your needs to have safety and to protect your family, and to protect, protect your property. So it's the same with dogs. I can teach a dog that is, uh, has a history, let's say, of guarding their food bowl, some alternative behaviors. Be like, hmm, instead of trying to bite me, let's try this instead. Yeah. But really the, the, the secret to it is to address the whole reason for the behavior in the first place, so underlying motivation. So if we, if we kind of change the association for the dog, that when people go near your food bowl, better things happen for you, not worse things that you're used to, like people touching you or sticking their hand in the food bowl and doing all those silly things humans can do. We can teach the dog, oh, when somebody approaches, something good's about to happen. Maybe some better treats are being tossed in my bowl. And that's how we can really shift the frequency of the behavior that we don't want to see to something we do want to see. But that doesn't mean that behavior is ever going to go away completely because I can go right back to doing silly human things and sticking my hand in that fruit ball again. And the dog's going to say, oh, you know what? It was cool before when you were approaching and you were giving me treats, but now you're sticking your hand in my food ball again. Yeah. What's going on here? And so, you, you know, you might make it less likely for them to try to bite you that next time you do it, but it's always still a possibility. So, um, yeah, behavior is never guaranteed, but we can certainly push the odds in our favor when we're working with these cases. Now, prevention obviously is better than cure um how do you prevent uh, if you're working with a puppy this uh, resource guarding behaviors how do you prevent them and i mean would would sticking your hand in a puppy's bowl would that does that work i mean i know people have various different 
um, techniques and methods of how to prevent behavior as well as working with behavior. Um, I tend not to, I have to say with puppies, stick my hands in their bowl, even in the beginning. Um, I, I might do other things, but what do you think about that? Because I know it's a little controversial. Yeah, you know, so every technique out there is going to work some of the times or else it wouldn't be a passed down technique, right? And so sticking your hand in the food bowl can certainly um, get a dog in the name of getting used to it. We might try that, but there's a lot of potential side effects or fallout from doing that. And I am a perfect example of seeing that happen. Uh, and a lot of the business that I've had, uh, I've gotten in the past is because people are doing those things. Yeah. In fact, I have a case that I actually might share during the presentation is uh, a dog that the owners, well-meaning owners, really trying to do the best thing. They're going online, doing their research about how to raise a puppy. And one of the articles they found is stick your hand in the food bowl, pet the dog while they're eating, take the food bowl away so they know <laughs> you're the boss and all these myths that are out there. Oh. And it actually yeah. created a very severe resource guarding case in this golden retriever where the dog got to the point of actually leaving the food bowl to attack the, the husband that lived in the home and sent him to the hospital a couple of times. That was a, a very severe case. And that could have been prevented if they had just done the opposite. And so I always recommend just you know, preventative maintenance, much like we do many other things with our puppies, you know, we, we work on socialization and getting them used to different environments. Why not get them used to some random person walking by their food bowl? We're not going to touch them. We're not going to annoy them, but we're going to present something better for them. So they start looking forward to people coming near their food bowl, especially in, in environments where there's a lot of people in the home, kids, lots of visitors, adults, and there could be a potential resource. Why not try to make that puppy feel a lot better about anybody approaching the resources? Uh, that's a great way to prevent it. And the nice thing is, is that the, the behavior change strategy you use in resource garden cases is very similar to the preventative maintenance you can do ahead of time with puppies. So um, once you learn the strategy in one aspect, you can apply it to others. But of course, you're going to be safer with the dogs that have a history of aggression, but very much the same process. Let's just change how that dog feels. Have you, um, there is, I guess, some trainers like to use a technique called food sharing. Food sharing with puppies, new dogs that come into their house where they'll eat a little bit of the food first. And this is not eating food out of the bowl like we used to think, you know, and if you eat out, then you're the alpha and all of that crap, which is what I was taught when I, excuse me, that was my computer, which is what I was taught when I first started was that you have to eat out of the bowl before the dog and all that stuff. But I'm talking about now that food sharing. So I eat a little bit, you eat a little bit. I eat a little bit, you eat a little bit. Have you ever seen that? I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's one of those things that it doesn't hurt to try, but I don't think makes much of a difference. Because if you think of what's happening there, it's really almost like we're just giving the dog treats out of our treat pouch. Because for, for most yeah. dogs, possession is nine tenths of the law as they say. And so if the dog has possession of it, if they already are eating out of a food bowl or they have possession of a bone or a toy in their mouth, that's different than when we have it and we're just sharing it with them. So yes. whether it comes out of our mouth or our treat pouch or our hand, the dog's just getting food from us, which they don't have possession of yet until we actually give it to them. And usually with food and treats, it's, it's what I call one and done. They, they eat it and they swallow it. And the, again, no possession of it. So uh, that particular technique, I don't uh, use it in my cases, but it, you know, it's, if the owner wants to do that, why not incorporate in some training? If you want to do that, um, teach the dog some other things, but yeah, it won't usually make much of a difference with dark dogs who resource guard things. Yeah. Now you only don't, yeah, I mean, you don't only just work with resource guarding, you work with, um, other types of aggressive behavior or other forms of aggressive behavior. What would you say other than resource guarding is the most common? Uh, right now, it's probably the leash reactivity cases. So dogs that bark and lunge at other dogs or people when they're out on walks. And I think that's a function of the pandemic also, just a lot of lack of socialization, lack of getting out there. Um, and I see it in certain areas. Interestingly, I've started traveling again. So I've seen it in pockets of the US where it's more prevalent depending on the culture of that area. And mm -hmm. one area I was in in California, they, it's a significant issue because it's the, there's so many off-leash dogs running up to the on-leash dogs, which is a nice. huge problem, especially for the on-leash dogs that already have issues. 
and and the culture of it's like they're blaming the unleashed dogs like you should train your dog better or it should actually be maybe you should train your off leash dog a little better not to run up to unleashed dogs or have a good recall if you're going to do that so yeah that's that's probably the most common issue i'm seeing uh definitely the leash reactivity cases resource guarding is also very common here's why it's the with the pandemic everybody's working from home or they're home a lot more so what happens there is you're presenting a lot more resources so if the person is the resource and the dogs maybe you have two dogs in the home competing over that person's attention now you're there almost all day long so Mm -hmm. it's like you're putting a food bowl out or a bone out all day long or it's just generally resources in general so it can be the kids home you know they're snacking on something and food's falling to the floor Um, and so there's many more opportunities during the day for dogs to guard items and it adds actually i've seen ad where it can add a lot of stress and you start to get those generalized guarding cases so you know the pandemic has presented some really interesting trends in aggression cases and and resource guarding leash reactivity slash aggression issues um and i would say fear-based cases too so lack of socialization issues you know so not being exposed to certain things in the world um you know in in certain aspects of the world so maybe not seeing the first maybe they're seeing their first stroller somebody pushing the first stroller or a bike for the first time so that's probably in the top those are probably my top three that i'm seeing and my students are seeing the same thing as well now it's a normal natural reaction when a dog growls or lunges or tries to bite somebody to tell that dog off and um and it's sometimes even if you know that you know that that might not have any effect that's kind of your gut reaction anyway Um, because sometimes resource guarding can be quite a shock what do you say because should we never say no to our dogs should we never say uh can't do that uh or can we never do that is that damaging if we do and if we can't do it what do we do instead how do we how do we say we don't want this behavior to happen that is a great question because it uh, it's making me think of building on this analogy i use all the time so the analogy i use to explain to my clients what resource guarding is is a human analogy because it helps them kind of grasp what they would feel if they were experiencing some provocative stimulus or some threatening uh, thing in the environment and so i always i tell them just picture yourself you're starving you've been working all day you haven't had a meal finally you get to go out to your favorite restaurant you go to your restaurant you sit down at your usual table and somebody comes over and sticks their hand in your plate as soon as the plate's put in front of you or they try to take it away or they try to pat you on top of your head just as you're about to take that first bite what's your reaction going to be you might say do everything from hey don't do that which is kind of the dog's equivalent of a growl all the way on up to maybe punching that person which is kind of the equivalent of a bite so your response is going to vary depending on how you're feeling and maybe how hungry you are and what your defense mechanisms have been in the past so same thing for dogs you might have a different variation but now what if that person yells at you hey don't yell at me right how fair is that to you when they're the one sort of committing that uh, assault in a way or that that you know that threatening aspect of what they're doing and we're just responding you know hey don't do that and then they say don't say that to me it's the same thing as if we were to say that to the dogs in most aggression cases because they're just responding aggressively because of some underlying fear or association something we are doing or another dog is doing or whatever is in the environment that's sort of triggering that aggressive behavior they're just responding to that and that's normal and so we don't usually fault humans for responding defensively to a threat so why are we faulting dogs so often or yelling at dogs or punishing mm-hmm. dogs and in really what's the the most tragic cases that i see are when either a dog is very fearful and they respond aggressively and we're punishing them or they're experiencing profound anxiety for instance think about how unfair that is for a human if we were to do the same thing you know to a you know six-year-old child just they're just really crying and they're lashing out because they're afraid of somebody that just threatened them and we say don't do that to the child i mean how awful is that or what's even more tragic is the pain-based cases so oh my gosh issues, and yes. the dog growls at somebody for maybe petting them and then you know somebody says oh your dog's just being dominant or alpha or you're not being alpha enough and so that person escalates their own behavior and uses more force for a dog that's in pain you imagine you know going to somebody and they're they're you know in 
trying to rest in bed and they've got, they just had surgery or something. And, you know, we touched them on the leg and where they just had surgery and they, they said, ouch. And then and you said to them, don't say ouch to me. Let me grab that leg harder in the name of dominance. <laughs> just think oh, I, it's I awful. It. It's just, it's awful because as you're saying that, I'm just picturing it. And, and it's just, it's just a slippery slope that so many people slide down. And it's terrible because that's my next question to you was about this term dominance aggression. Um, and that so many people think when dogs are exhibiting aggressive behavior that they are trying to uh, dominate them. I mean, and, and then it does cause that that sort of confrontational relationship between, well, you're not going to be alpha over me. So now I have to escalate my behavior to put you in your place. And then it's just I mean, it, it's it's so it's devastating it, it is and it can sort of ties into it, one of the common uh, comments i'll get is you know I, I don't get it i give him all his food i give him his toys i provide a home and so it's almost like we feel like the dog owes us something in a way and and i kind of hear those comments but we have to understand again we're bringing the dog into our home and we're expecting them to to adapt to all of the things we're putting in front of them and so we have to kind of think about it from their lens and what they're experiencing rather than, oh, we give them everything, so they should just obey us all the time. But these are sentient living beings that we have to remember that they have emotions, they have, you know, their own responses that are have been, you know, instinctually bred into them for many, many years. And so uh, eons, you know, living humans living with dogs. And so it's sometimes difficult, right, to comprehend, you know, why would a dog do this to me when I'm the provider of all good things? But 99.99% of the time, there's always a good reason for the dog displaying the aggressive behavior. And if we dig deep into why they're doing it, then we'll understand that, hey, I don't need to punish this dog for expressing themselves. I need to understand it. I need to listen to what my dog is saying. And then I can adapt my own behavior and we can live happily ever after, after those changes have been made, right? Yeah. Um, I'm sure you get asked this question all the time. Uh, are there some dogs that just cannot be helped. Uh, yes, uh, my colleague Trish always says this. Trish McMillan always says there's just like the human population, there's going to be a Jeffrey Dahmer out there of dogs, and that's true. You know, I've, I've, and this is it's rare, but in the thousands and thousands and thousands of cases I've seen, it's, it's you will see some dogs that are truly dangerous, and um, sometimes it is a function of their, uh, you know, unfortunate exposure to certain things in their life early on uh the, the environment that's been created for them and they've taken it to a sort of this extreme level because of the extreme conditions they've been placed in so sometimes you get that and sometimes genetics play a role as well so genetics and wiring can go you know sideways sometimes but for everybody listening that is very rare for, for yeah. most yes very rare helped. yeah most dogs can be helped and and there's there you can read them well and you can understand the behavior, but there are a very small percentage of dogs that, that really are dangerous. Now, there, at this conference, obviously, there are a lot of trainers and we have a lot of dog lovers uh, too as well, just so if you are, you don't have to be an animal care professional to come to the conference because you'll get a lot of great information. Um, but what do you advise people do if they see that their dog has some kind of resource guarding issue or some is exhibiting aggressive behavior? what should what should be the first thing that they do always my first rule of uh, thumb is to uh, seek out a professional <laughs> to help you okay. because they're yeah. going to be somebody that is also experienced in the issue you're you're having and and interview that person you know ask what type of methods they use do they have experience working with this issue do they have references those kind of things can be very helpful to make sure you find the right person because that's first and foremost i could say go find somebody but you don't want to find the wrong person make sure you're getting the right person to help you so that's first and foremost. But then the next thing, this is true of all aggression cases, is identify where it happens, the contexts and the environment in which it happens. And for the time being, until you get some help, is to manage it. So if the dog is growling near the food bowl, one of the easiest fixes is just don't go near the dog while it's eating or feed it in a separate area while it's eating. And then once it's done eating, let it out of that area and then go clean up the food bowl and everything else you have to do. So very simple, straightforward management strategy. But that if you think about all aggression cases, the number one thing to do is avoid any further aggressive incidents by managing them. So managing the environment as best we can until we can get some help to then replicate that same context 
but we're going to do it in a systematic way that the dog doesn't ever feel the need to display aggressive behavior because we've set them up for success in our training um, you know, protocol. So if it's the dog that guards it, guards the food bowl, we might set the food bowl up again, but we're going to approach it systematically where maybe I'm approaching from 20 feet away and to tossing treats from that distance or, you know, so there's, that's the next step is then you figure out, okay, I understand where it happens. I understand why it happens. Now let me address that why it happens. And so let's change and in most new regression cases. Again, it's changing how the dog feels about that particular situation. So I want that dog that guards the food bowl to feel very good about me approaching versus I don't like it when people approach because they're a potential threat. So generally, if you look at all, really all problem behaviors, when you think about it, Victoria, right? It's just that you're always looking at management, identifying the reason, and then alternative behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. And for aggression, the additional step is changing the association. So mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty similar, regardless of the behavior problem we're seeing, it's just, of course, fine tuning and adjusting depending on the actual behavior and the family. I am very, very happy that you're speaking at the conference because I really, I don't think people can get enough on this subject and because it is so common. And again, I, uh, it's probably along with SEP angst right now and or separation issues, um, the, the number one thing that people are experiencing with their dogs. I seem to see it more now. I don't know whether that is your experience as well, that you're seeing more and more cases. Um, I know that speaking to Kim Brophy, we were talking about, and I know you've had her on your podcast. She's wonderful and she's speaking at the conference too, but she was saying that is a product of our changing environment um, and, and the, the, the pressure that um, living in our, our modern homes and with our modern lives is putting on our dogs. Are you seeing that there are more cases? Absolutely. I think there's, uh, you know, it's reached epidemic proportions in terms of aggression cases. My students are all, most of them are overwhelmed with cases booking two to three months out. And I do, I agree with Kim. It's, it's very much a function of our society right now, the environment we're asking dogs to be in, where we, it's multifaceted. So get where we're getting dogs, how we're breeding dogs, um, the impact of, you know, how we're trying to save as many dogs as possible. Um, you know, there's so many variables that it's, I think they're all kind of combining to create this perfect storm of lots of behavior issues. And it's, it's really, you know, it's sad to see because we've taken dogs and we've in many cases pulled them out of environments that we've asked them to be in for many, many generations. And now we're asking them to be in a completely different situation. Right? Yes. <laughs> so you take your, you know, your livestock guardian dog that's from good stock that's been, you know, the whole past generations have lived on a farm doing something as livestock guardian too. And then we bring them into an apartment in New York City, you know, that next puppy in the generation. And we expect that dog to not bark at things going by or, or not maybe try to protect or roam that property or the apartment area. It's totally completely unfair for them when you think about it. And so, yeah. Those are the cases you'll see a lot of uh, where it's just a it's just a, a difficult environment for that dog. Yeah, well, um, I'm so glad that you do the work you do. I'm so glad that you have a course where uh, people can learn more about how to deal with aggressive behavior, a what aggressive behavior is and how to work with it. Uh, if people are interested in taking a course, well, a how do they get in contact with you or find out more information? about you and about your courses that that would be uh, that would help them sure um everything it can be found on aggressivedog.com so it's really easy to remember aggressivedog.com <laughs> aptly named yes and um <laughs> all of the information about the podcast the courses the webinars the conference everything you need to know articles i've got um, some guest writers coming in to do some articles on aggression so it's all in one place easy to find and uh, people can reach out to me there as well um, I have some social media accounts that people can follow also that, that are linked on the site, but I'm easy to find. It's Michael Shikashio on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. <laughs> so. Perfect. Brilliant. Well, wow, 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 wow. Everybody, you got to register. You got to register, come to the Dog Behavior Conference, and you can hear Mike Shikashio talking about resource guarding and um, uh, what to do when you've, when you've done everything that you think you know, what, you know, you've done everything you can, and then 
oh my gosh, what do you do now? So um, thank you, Mike, for, for joining me today. And I cannot wait to see you at the conference. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. You take care.